A slurry pipeline transports a mixture of materials suspended in a liquid or gas. These materials are usually particles of solid matter such as sand, clay, or other minerals, and they're suspended typically in a liquid base such as water or oil. Now, slurry pipelines are used in many industries such as mining, oil and gas, and agriculture. Today, we're going to optimize the design of this slurry pipeline. We have some trade-offs here where limestone is going to be crushed at the quarry mixed with water to form a slurry and pump through a pipe. We'd like to minimize the operating cost, which is primarily determined by the grinding power and the pumping power. Okay, so we've got to go a full 15 miles with this slurry pipeline. And we need a flow rate of limestone of at least 12.67 pound mass per second. All right, now the average lump size of the limestone before grinding is 0 0.1. So as we go through this problem statement here on the left, we're also going to develop this optimization model on the right. So first of all, we'll import NumPy and Gecko. And if you don't have Gecko, just come to a pip install Gecko and it'll download the latest version for you. Okay, so there's our slurry pipeline. We'll define some constants. There's our length of pipeline in feet. And then we also have the mass flow of pipeline, of the limestone. Okay, then the average lump size before grinding, and then we'll have pi there as well for some calculations. We'll have the density of water and the viscosity of water, as well as a gravitational constant conversion uh, between pound mass and pound force and then also the density of the limestone as well. Okay, then we're gonna define some variables. So let's go ahead and just look at that in the problem statement and look at some of the variables that we need to determine. So this is gonna be the average flow velocity in feet per second. All right, and then we also have a volumetric concentration of slurry, so we can run it more dilute or less dilute. And then we also have an internal diameter of the pipe all right, average limestone particle size after grinding, a flow rate of the water, and then a density of the slurry. So we need to take a couple things into account. Uh, we need the velocity must exceed, okay, the sedimentation and clogging rate. So we have to have a minimum velocity. Uh, the formula for grinding power is it's not valid for a particle size below that. Um, and then, we, so we want to stay clear of that because we don't know how it's going to behave if we get uh, below that particle size. Okay, the concentration of limestone in the pipe must be less than that at which a pot pipe uh, blockage would occur, and the pipe diameter must not exceed six inches, above which the initial cost would be excessive. So we need to keep that pipe fairly small. All right, so let's go ahead and use a couple expressions to build the model after we put in our variables here. So here's our average flow velocity, and I'm going to limit that between 1 and 20. I can also give it a name V if I want to. That's optional. Okay, there's the volumetric concentration of the slurry as well. Internal pipe diameter. All right, I'm going to put that in feet, so half a foot, 6 inches. And then the average particle size after grinding, that's also in feet. And, okay, here's our, um, okay, so PT as well. Okay, that's our final, um, I think that's the density of the slurry. Okay, we'll have to check on that one later. Okay, so then we're going to go on to um, some of these additional variables. Okay, so the following expressions will be used to build a model where PG, okay, this is the power for grinding. All right, so this is our starting diameter and then the final diameter right there. So as those get smaller, the, you know, for D, as that gets smaller, then the power for the grinding goes up. All right, and that has a unit of a foot, pound force per second, and W's in, uh, pound mass per second, and then all of these are in feet. So all of this is in imperial units. You can convert it to SI units if you'd like. All right, so uh, let's look at the pumping 
uh, power for pumping. So that was the power for grinding. Now we want to look at the power for pumping as well. So this is the friction factor for the slurry is estimated uh, by this expression. These are just going to be empirical expressions. You can see all of the values that are defined right there. So let's go ahead and just uh, calculate a couple things. Like we've got uh, Reynolds number. We'll need that uh, later on. We'll have the friction factor. And we have some choices here on calculating the friction factor uh, and FW. Okay, so let's go on just a little bit. Um, the friction factor of water is given by, okay, one of these two expressions. If we have a Reynolds number uh, less than 10 to the fifth, then we're going to use this expression. And greater than, we're going to use this expression right here. So this is common, you know, between turbulent and laminar flow. You have a Reynolds number transition where the flow regime changes, and there might be a different equation for those. So I'm going to show you, you know, two different ways to model this. We have that friction factor. Okay, I'm going to say false there because we're going to do the second option first. Okay, we can either create a new polynomial expression like is shown here where right at this um, 10 to the fifth right here we're going to transition from one equation to the other so the green line that's the one we want to follow in this regime and then the blue line that's the one we want to follow in this regime so we can either take those two expressions and create a polynomial fit for it like we've shown right here that uh, just covers that whole area or we can just uh, put an if statement in our model so we have the first expression that's right there at the top the second expression and then we include an if3 statement in gecko and that includes a binary switching variable uh, that enables you to have continuous first and second derivatives for the model you don't have a discontinuity there Okay, so that's an if statement. We'll go ahead and use that one. So if we set this to true, then it's going to use this first one. If we set it to false, then it's going to use this one instead to define FW. All right, so let's go down here. We have uh, some more. Here's our uh, the factor RW. Okay, there's the Reynolds number right there. Okay, and then we have another expression. Um, now this one is uh, the CD, the drag coefficient of the coefficient of the particles. The drag coefficient combines with the Reynolds number for the particle as a mentionless quantity which depends on the particle diameter. Okay, so we have some data that relates this to CD. And this empirical relationship, we need to do something with this to put this into our expression because we need this relationship in our model. Okay, so so anyway, we um, we're gonna have, have a couple options for this one as well. Okay, so one way that we can do this is to uh, create a cubic spline. Okay, so it's gonna interpolate between these data points with a cubic polynomial that um, is going to be able to to best uh, you know create a correlation based on off of these data points uh, the other way that we could do it is similar to what we did before where we took those uh, data points or expressions and made a generalized function that would fit that whole region so let's just look at some of this data right here I'm just going to pull this up in Excel and if you can see these values get very high right here. So if I just look at this in Excel, you can see the plot it almost looks like a left angle right there. So that's going to be very nonlinear. So if instead we look at the natural log of CDRP2, uh, and the natural log of CD, and we do the correlation between those, then it's going to um, not be quite as nonlinear. Okay, so I'll do the natural log of this, and then I'll copy this equation over. All right.
right, so now if I insert a chart here, then I can see it looks a little bit better in terms of being able to fit this. Okay, so you could come up with an expression or you could do a cubic spline that uh, would maybe give you uh, just as good of, of uh, an expression without having to think of a correlation that you can use. Okay, so um, I'm gonna not save this. We're just gonna pull this data, okay? Um, either, okay, so here's C2, CDRP2. Okay, we have an expression for that, but we don't have, we need to get it back to CD, okay? The, this uh, drag coefficient of the particles. So if we're gonna use the cubic spline, okay, we're gonna import pandas, and we'll go ahead and get it from this course website, okay, where the problem statement is located, and there's a table right here. So we're just going to use pandas to pull this table in to the problem statement. All right, so we'll get that from the URL, and we'll just read HTML. We will create three new variables, okay, this natural log transform, and then include our expressions to relate the natural log to the regular variable for both of those. And then here's our cubic spline. Okay, now there's additional details about uh, cubic splines here in the documentation. Um, you can go to the AP Monitor website and this will give you a little bit more description about how cubic splines work to take data points and then make expressions out of them. And you can see it's not going to extrapolate very well here on the sides. Now there's also some documentation in uh, read the docs, okay, the gecko documentation, and if you search for C-spline, you can see a little bit more detail about how this works. And once that finishes searching, you'll see um, it'll point you to the correct documentation for C-spline. I think it's in the model building functions. So I'll just search for that. Somehow the search wasn't working there as fast as I wanted it to. Okay, so there you can see the function inputs with variables and then your data, and it creates a cubic spline for you. Okay, so there's our cubic spline that we've loaded in. And the other option is to, you know, think of a correlation that fits this, and you know, maybe that's gonna be a polynomial as well of that natural log expression. So you could use that approach as well. Right now we have cubic spline being used. So that set that to false if you'd like to switch over to this polynomial form. All right, so let's keep going. We have the density. Okay, so after this, this is our density right here. Um, slurry density. All right, and then we have the limestone specific gravity. Okay. So we have these other expressions like pressure drop, limestone, uh, specific gravity. Uh, we're going to continue on slurry friction factor as well. Okay, I'm going to build that out. Um, okay. There we go. And then we have our pressure drop, delta P, which is right here. All right, and then we have our cross-sectional area of the pipe and the slurry flow rate as well. All right, we have a slurry mass flow rate, a limestone mass flow rate. The limestone is ultimately what we want to transport. We can dilute it more, it's gonna flow better. Uh, you know, maybe save on some of the, the costs of moving it, but you're not gonna uh, be able to deliver as much limestone. All right, so there's our mass flow rate. You have the friction power loss as well, and a grinding power. So you have some utility costs as you, um, you know, increase the grinding power and get it down to smaller diameter particles. There's our critical velocity that we're going to have to stay above, and we've got, um, you know, the total power is going to be the grinding plus the pumping. And then we have a mass flow rate of limestone. So we just redefine that variable. There's our critical velocity constraint, inequality constraint, and then we want to minimize the power. 
Okay, we'll set it to APOPT solver and then solve it. Okay, it'll print the optimal power at the end. So let's go ahead and just open up a command terminal here and I'll change to my desktop and then with Python, I'll run this slurry.py. Okay, it was a successful solution. There's my optimal power right there, 253,000, okay. Um, so let's go ahead and change some of these. So you can see C-spline is one of them. Uh, let's go ahead and just use that polynomial instead. So I just want to highlight the importance of some of these correlations and how it's going to change the answer. So the other thing I'm going to do is just set solve, I'll set display equals false. So it doesn't show the solver output. We can just see the objective. Oh, did I save that? Okay, display equals false. <clears throat> okay. So there's the optimal power right there. You can see it changed it uh, quite a bit uh, based on using that other correlation. So we gotta, you know, this is one of the things that's really important about developing these correlations is that, um, you know, you don't want to, uh, this, this, in this case, it's gonna develop, you know, be much more power there. So I'm gonna go back to this polynomial one right here. Okay, so you can see uh, that if statement, sometimes it has a harder time finding the optimal solution if you have, might have found a local optimum. Um, so sometimes you need to update the initial guess values. But you can see this one using the polynomial is able to find that a little bit better. So let me go back to here on the cubic spline. I'll change this one back. We have a couple options of the different forms we can use. Okay, so you can see uh, fairly similar. Uh, this one was a much higher solution. It must have found a local uh, minimum that was not optimal. Okay, and you can keep running this, develop you know these correlations so they more accurately reflect the trade-offs that you have in this pumping system. Okay, so that's it for this. I wanna show you one additional thing. We've named some of the variables. If you ever wanna go and you know troubleshoot what's going on in the model you can always do m open folder and then be able to view the run folder okay it'll open up the temporary folder okay this is where the temporary files are stored and if you open up the model file okay you can open it up with a text editor for example you're going to see this in the ap monitor modeling language where it shows you the variables, the constraints. You have your intermediate variables as well. And then you have your equations and uh, you have your C-spline, how it did the C-spline object as well. So with this, it helps you debug it a little bit because now you've translated the Python into just equations. And it then compiles this into bytecode for automatic differentiation and to efficiently solve it with solvers like APOPT and um, IPOPT and others. So there's your model file right there. You can also see you know, if you need to get into some of the data as well. Um, you, you, know, you could see a data file, for example, uh, where it constructs, uh, you know, builds some of the models, okay, or just gives you initial conditions. All right, and then it also shows you a results.csv file, and this will show you all of the results. So um, I didn't rename most of these. Some of them we did rename, so they're a little easier to see. If you don't name them, it gives it you know an intermediate, just intermediate zero through intermediate seven. And if you don't name the variables, or, or these might be slack variables as well, it'll just give it variable zero, zero, one, two, three. Okay, so here's a Slack variable as well. All right, it also returns it as a JSON file, if you're interested in that one, um, and import it with a JSON file. 
Okay, so that's it uh, for this tutorial exercise. Let me come back here to the optimization course and just give a quick overview of what we've done already and where we're going with some of these. These are in the homework section. You can see the slurry pipeline is one of these case studies here on the right. And we're gonna go on to oxygen furnace next, uh, but you can look back at some of these other ones uh, such as you know, these other design optimization problems to help you get more familiar with some of the optimization terminology and strategies to make these work.